Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome back. I am very excited um, to join everybody tonight for what I think is going to be one of our most humorous, enjoyable um, sessions that, that we have had. Um, we've covered a lot of um, sort of serious topics, some lighthearted topics, and tonight we're sort of bringing ready a group together to talk about journaling and as a method of self-care and I sort of labeled it jour journaling through or writing through as a cancer therapy. Um, and so that is going to be our session topic today. And we have some folks who all come at it from slightly different perspectives and slightly different angles and have done different things with their journaling or their writing or their blogging, depending on which of the three um, women who are with us tonight that you're talking about, and also come at it both as patients and as caregivers. Um, and so each of them will sort of give us a little introduction to start out to um, who they are, a little bit about themselves, a little bit about their journaling or writing experience that may um, give us all a little hint as to why I invited them here um, tonight. And um, so I am randomly choosing just based on the squares so I can keep track of everybody, um, but also based on how long I've known folks. So Christina, do you want to go first? We've known each other the longest. I was about to say, I was like, um, actually, she likes to just look at my face, uh, which is why I'm here. <laughs> I also tell inappropriate jokes. Um, <laughs> So um, I'm Christina Avalos. Um, I was actually Dr. Weddington's patient um, several years ago. I hit my four year mark. Um, so C125 is 10.1, Dr. Weddington. Yes. Um, and um, so I was her patient at stage four ovarian um, when I was pregnant with my son, who may or may not interrupt. Um, and I am a teacher. I'm an English teacher in Woodbridge. Um, I am an adjunct faculty with NOVA, um, with the NOVA Community College. Um, and I am also a doctoral student at Hopkins, um, studying why, um, you know, why patients with gynecologic cancers uh, can benefit from um, journaling because I blogged through my journey. So a little bit of the academic side of, of journaling and the cancer journey. There is actually a growing, very small still, but very small body of literature um, that is actually largest that I find in breast cancer and, and kidney cancers, looking at the impact of journaling on a woman's or man's, and since it cross, cross gender in those two groups, on a woman or man's experiences and some of the, the medical impacts that we see from the, from the journaling experience. So. I'll leave some of that in because I have a little bit. Of yeah, the, the literature's like this much. I, I, right. <laughs> that's what I've been doing for the past year. I mean, it's it's like we're we're doing the literature, ladies. We are making the literature right now. So it's happening. I like that. Marisha, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Marisha Burton. Um, like Christina, I'm also a teacher. Hey, girl. <laughs> Um, I teach world history at the high school level, um, but I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2012. Um, I was actually in the middle of my college studies at Bowie State University, so it has been a little while um, since I have been on the up and up. I went through chemotherapy in 2013, um, so it's been a little while for me, but uh, I made it through by way of blogging. I had a blog at the time, so for me, blogging was really uh, beneficial to just kind of getting a lot of things out of my mind, out of my hair, um, being able to provide a space for me just to, you know, expel all of the feelings that I was feeling at the time. So, um, yeah. And Jen, last but not least, you want to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and, and some of your writing. Yes, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you, ladies. Um, my name is Jen Koch and I've been a coach 23 years. I've had my own practice for five years and I coach what I call badass boss ladies who don't feel so badass anymore. I'm an expert in imposter syndrome and helping them embrace their genius and own their success. I'm a speaker and I am a published author, Amazon bestseller. And the title of my book is called When I Die, Take My Panties. Turning Your Darkest Moments into Your Greatest Gifts, was, which was my... Um, way to deal with my grief over my mom's passing from stage four ovarian cancer and um, seven rewrites in four years to publish. And I use that as my platform to educate women about ovarian cancer because my mom was misdiagnosed for a year. 
we knew nothing about it. We didn't know the signs or symptoms. Um, didn't have a history of it in our family, even though we're Ashkenazi Jewish. Mom had all the genetic testing. Uh, her CA125 was never an indicator. And so it was really quite a conundrum when she was diagnosed with it. And it took them a long time to find it. She, after her initial diagnosis, she lived five and a half years, actually five years, one month and eight days. It'll be the 10 year anniversary of her death. And then I'm also a breast cancer. I don't like survivor, breast cancer thriver. In the middle of the pandemic, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, stage 2A in August, uh, had two surgeries and radiation. I'm currently cancer free and on a med for the next 10 years on an astrazole. But here was the kicker for me. I had had all the genetic testing done. I had actually had a full hysterectomy just to make sure that I wasn't gonna get ovarian cancer. And so it was such a shock to me to be diagnosed with breast cancer. I didn't know 85% of it was not genetic. And for about two months, I kept everything to myself. And then I started sharing about it during Breast Cancer Awareness Week, we had a whole check your chest campaign because 40% of women were not, was mammograms were down 40%. I began writing about it. I began vlogging about it. And I began talking about it in the way that I wanted to. And that was really important to me in my journey. I'm happy to be here too. Thank you. So one of the things I, you know, depending on what topic, everybody has their, their introductions, which all are on topic with what we're discussing tonight. But in general, I also ask folks for a fun fact, something about you that's not blogging, not writing, not about your personal cancer journey, but something amusing. So for instance, one of the faculty here with me plays English handbells and he studied English handbells when he was younger. For instance, another faculty here who's done one of our sessions um, it, that does pottery and wood, woodworking pottery, not clay pottery, but, but woodworking. Um, so something, something fun. And I, a, one of my partners, actually, she um, is a cyclist and she rode her bicycle to her wedding, um, which is one of my favorite facts about her always just says, says a lot about her, I think, um, and her spirit. So um, for each of you, what is a non-blogging fun fact about you that sort of gives a good sense of your, of your other, other non-writing, uh, non-cancer side? And you guys, anybody can go first, whoever has it come to their mind first. I'm happy to go first. I'm a recovering yeah. stand-up comedian. I did stand-up comedy mm -hmm. uh, in Denver for six years, like performing every stupid week uh, until I moved to DC, performed a couple of times, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, yeah, but I still love to get out there once the pandemic's over and we can get out to perform again. I love performing. That's, That's cool. I'm, I'm from Colorado. I'm actually from the Springs. So okay. that's, I go to Colorado every, every year. Um, awesome. Um, I guess my, I guess I have a bunch of weird facts, but, um, <laughs> Stephanie's like, yeah, yeah, she does. Um, <laughs> I rescue bad dogs. Um, you rescue what? Bad, bad dogs. <laughs> do, do you see my, you see that situation right there on my door? Oh. Yo, I oh. rescue bad dogs. They oh, just, what? they just happen upon me and I just, I can't. Do you train them then to not do that and then give them to somebody else? Or do you keep them? No, I, I, I keep the bad dogs um, because- okay. how, how many do you have? Three. Oh, wow. I have two beagles and a husky. Oh. Um, and all of them somehow ended up being rescues. Two of them from our shelter. One was from a, a bad breeding situation. And so they all have very weird quirks. Hmm all of them, but they all love my shoe. So either I need to see a foot doctor um, because either I have very sexy feet or very disgusting feet because they are in love with my shoes. Your shoes. All Just three mine. Of them? All, all three of them go for the shoes? Yeah. All three of them, both Beagles, Justice and Waffles and Luna, all three of them. I can hear them. They're the only reason they're not coming through is because there's a, 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 there's a dog door. safety lock. I, I thought you said you rescue bad dolls, D-O-L-L-S. Oh, oh my, no. that is amazing. And then I had a moment because there's a doll hospital in Denver that freaks me out and I would a never go in there. And I have a friend who collects them and used to keep them on the shelf behind her for Zoom. And I'd be like, please put a blanket over the doll. Yeah, Christina's got it, no. <laughs> people die in some movies. Don't get no. curious, y'all. No. I mean, that's like the whole blinky eyes, you know, the old fashioned ones where the faces yes. are all, oh. yes, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's crazy. So, um, well, I'm with y'all. I'm from Minnesota. 
Um, I was born in Minnesota. So I, I mean, at this point, everybody's like, at this point, you're from this area because I've lived here now since uh, 2000. So I really yeah. am from here, but no, I'm from Minnesota. Um, and I am, guys, I am on the Peloton wave. <laughs> Uh, I um I love my Peloton so I had to take a little hiatus um my mom she was having some health struggles in February and we actually flew to LA for her to have a surgery um so that kind of threw me off my game but I am on day eight day eight of my 10 day smoothie cleanse so when I wow. finish that I'll get back on my regularly scheduled program but all me my friends and I we all have Peloton bikes and we all get on and ride together so That's yeah awesome. I'm, I'm I'm in the pillow I'm the, I'm one of those pillow You're people those. don't stop talking about the Peloton <laughs> <laughs> There's some lines, you guys though, look so I saw you stood up you're like Let's talk about the Peloton you guys like it's a do, you need one? do you need a recommendation do you need a room it is it's, it's like a, a friend cult. who's done like 1100 rides. It's a cult. It's a cult. It's, it's a cult. It's a cult. It's a cult. It is. But it's such a great cult to be a part of. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. Like, so I, I've, I, like I said, I've, you know, I had to take a little hiatus, you know, just get some things in order. And so one of my favorite instructors, Alex Toussaint, he has a nice Monday ride. He's a nice fine specimen to look at as well. I, I, was, like, girl, I was like, excuse me. <laughs> he's a nice, fine specimen. But he sent an email, like one of the you know emails came to, and I I, I felt like he personally emailed, emailed me you. to say, hey girl, where you been? Haven't seen you on the leaderboard in a while. So I like screenshotted it and posted it on my Instagram. Like y'all, my booze looking for me in class. <laughs> so yes, that's a fun fact about me. I love my Peloton. We can tell, I mean, <laughs> There is one thing about video, right? Like throughout the pandemic, I think all of us has learned the video captures everything. Joy. Everything. Love, yes. And you can we can tell how much you love the Peloton through It's amazing. Yeah. If you don't have one and so, anybody on Facebook, just go on ahead and do it. <laughs> okay. So that's actually good because one of the things we like to talk about a lot on, on our series is like health and wellness and mm -hmm. how to bring health and wellness into your life. And actually we did a session on, I call it movement, not exercise. Cause for some people, exercise is a very daunting thing, but if you just focus on moving, um, it's, it's a little bit easier sometimes to break into the habits that then become more traditional exercise. Um, but anyway, so we didn't talk about Peloton though, when we did our exercise session. So now I can yeah. out your little segment here and add it to that so we'll have a little Peloton um, advertisement. Now, how did each of you, I mean, it just a little bit, you hinted at you, why you started journaling or writing, you know, for, for um, Marisha and Christina as a part of your own experience. And then um, Jen, when you were talking about sort of memorializing or remembering your mom and, and writing about your experience caretaking for your mom. But what was that first moment that made you start journaling or writing? Like, where did it come from? Why did you do it? For me, it was my sister. Um, I was 20 years old when I was diagnosed and I am literally a fireball in life, right? So that's just always been my personality, very high energy, very much so life of the party. And um, when I had my first surgery, it was, it. I mean, I was different. I, I was not, I was not myself and, and, and the people that loved me could tell, right? Um, for me, I actually had two surgeries so I had, a, I had, my first surgery was in April, 2012. And it was kind of one of those like, oh, we seem we got all of it. You're, I think you're going to be good to go. You know, let's have some checkpoints, da, 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 boom, boom, boom. We think that you're good to go. And so when I re-entered, you know, when I went back full-time in school in the fall, I literally went back like nothing happened. Like people that knew me, really knew me, you know, they knew what was going on, um, but the masses did not know. Uh, I was a cheerleader in college. I was on this committee. I mean, I was, I was around, I was seen. And my second diagnosis in November was like a, okay, pump the brakes. Um, and that was when I was told, no, you're gonna actually have to go through chemotherapy. And this is going to be a little bit more than it was the first time, because going into my second surgery, I was like, oh, we're doing this again. Okay, cool. You know, you're going to slice me open. I'm going to be at home for a while. I'm not, you know, I'm going to be in pain. If I cough, it's going to hurt, right? I knew what to expect, but 
now when this has escalated now it's not you know this little section like it was before now we're going to have to put you you know into some treatment this is a little bit more serious i was like oh this is not what i expected this is not what i signed up for i thought i was just having a simple surgery again and i was going to move on with my life um and we that year my dad's one of my dad's sisters my dad's he's from mississippi and one of his sisters, um, she was having, she had a heart attack. And my grandmother was just like, let's all come home to Mississippi for Christmas. <laughs> and so we went home to Mississippi for Christmas, had a blast with my cousins. And it was kind of like my last big fun moment being regular, right? Before I came back and started chemo January 3rd. And so we came back um, a couple of days before New Year's and my sister goes, I think you should start a blog. Like what a blog. She's like, yeah, I think you should start a blog because you've been holding a lot of stuff in. And I anticipate that this is going to be a long process. And I don't think that you are going to be able to be okay with, you know, talking in a manner that you're going to feel comfortable just expressing yourself to mom and dad, because they're your parents, right? Like my mom, my dad, I can't just be real with you guys all the time because at the end of the day, I'm still your baby, right? And for my sister, it was, you know, I know you can come talk to me, but we also are going, you know, I'm going to be the one that's like, all right, you have what day of the week this week are we going to cry? Because we're not going to cry about this all week. Like pick a day, what what day, you know? So she said, you need, you, you need someone that you can speak to freely, that you can just get whatever you get out that is not going to ask you any questions mm -hmm. and will literally just be, you know, something to receive your feelings. And she said, the only thing I could think of is a blog. And I was like, I've never started a blog before. And she was like, there's literally nothing to it. You literally just start writing whatever you want to write. Start with an introduction. And what you can do is bring people up to speed. How did we get here? You're about to start chemotherapy, but I've been with you on this journey since, you know, uh, April, 2012. Tell people how we got here, bring them up to speed. And that's, that's kind of how I started my blog. Hmm. Wow. Jen, how did you start writing your book? Well, I, I'm, you know, as a coach for so long, so I want to preface this by saying, mm, I, I want to be able to express everything. And what I don't want to do is have fear be stricken in the hearts of people who are watching, right? Because yeah. ovarian cancer diagnosis and treatment is very different uh, in 2021 than it was in 2006 when my mom was diagnosed. So I'm going to preface it by saying that. When my mom was diagnosed, she she had been um, going to the, you know, she had a belly. My mother never had a belly. We have hips. It was like, I used to joke and say, God said, get in the hips line and the lips line. And I got in the hips line twice because I really don't have much lip, but we never had a belly. And my mom had a belly and she was hurting. And that was, we always had these flat, flat bellies. And she was going for irritable bowel and candida, all these different things. And at one point, her gynecologist had said to her, hey, you know, maybe we should have a, maybe you should do a hysterectomy, but I don't know if that's really what you need. And my mom's thought was, why am I going to, she was always very healthy, worked out. She started lifting weights when I was 15 years old. She brought me into lifting weight training. She was a vegetarian when I was 13, you know, very, very healthy, always active, uh, was worked for NASA was a teacher, by the way, um, developed curriculum for teachers to use NASA as a way to get kids interested in, in science and that sort of thing. So very, very healthy. And so my mom sort of reacted to her gynecologist and said, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And then eventually she went in for a hysterectomy on August 10th, 2006. And when her gynecologist was in there, she saw something on the peritoneal wall that didn't look right. The oncological surgeon was next door. The gynecological oncological surgeon was next door, brought him in. Yep, it's cancer. So she was diagnosed stage four C at that point was given less than a 18% chance of living five years. And that hit us like a ton of bricks. And throughout that process, my mother lived five years, one month and eight days, first of all, because she was the energizer bunny. She wasn't going to let anything keep her down. So if you can now imagine it's about a month before she's going to pass and that tumor, she now looked like she was nine months pregnant. And I had brought her to eat lunch. I went to see her and she was taking me through 
you know, here, I want you to have this fur that your grandfather made and gave to me. I want you to have this necklace. Then she opens his drawer, her drawer and she's got all these hanky pankies, which are the most comfortable thong underwear, really expensive. She's very frugal. She's like, look, goodwill won't take them. Don't throw them away. Take my panties, which is how the name of the book came about. So I took her to lunch with her girlfriends and as she was getting in the car, she was so exhausted. She was ready to go at that point, you know, it was about a month or so later that she passed, but she was going to take the seatbelt over this pregnant belly. That was her tumor. And I went to help her and she smacked my hand and said, I can do it because she wanted to do everything until the moment that she couldn't. And she let out this big, and so I just kind of sat there very quiet and she let out this big sigh. And she said, well, she said, I've had a beautiful life. I love a beautiful death. What do you say to that? And I just kind of sighed with her and we finished the visit and I flew back to Colorado and I went to church Sunday morning. I'm Jewish, but there's a unity church that I went to because I needed a place to go have a conversation with God. You don't believe in God, dog. Bob, the grass, I don't care. But for me, that's the way is my faith. And I sat in there and I went out for pie at the village Inn after. And I know Christina knows the, the village Inn because their lemon meringue pie is sky high. And I sat there over that wedge of pie and God had talked to me in the church and said, write a book about it. And I sat there and wrote the first two chapters and I called my mom and I said, mom, I said, your death is not going to be in vain. You were such a contribution throughout your life. We want your death to be a contribution too. And so the moment that book was published the day before I had been let go of my fourth job and I'd worked in politics for 25 years, was let go of that job and had another conversation with God and realized there was a bigger moment for me. And I thought it was to, to educate women about the signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer. Because if we had, if I knew, you know, whatever 2011, when she passed, what we knew in 2006 or 2005, when she started having symptoms, she would have been diagnosed early, but I didn't know anything. We didn't know anything. We didn't even know the reason we knew nothing. We didn't know the resources. And it was important to me to get that message out there to women, but also that I had learned three really key, um, I call it the caregiver's blueprint, only deal with the facts everything else is conjecture. Just deal with what, what's happening right now, right in this moment. What's your diagnosis? What's the staging? What's the next step? What anything else is worry about something that might happen. Number two, say everything, even the hard stuff, even the things you don't want to say. So when my mom wanted a second opinion, that was only going to give her a 10% chance of survival after getting, you know, six feet of her intestines taken out in her fifth year of having the cancer because she was in remission for a while. She had the cancer, she was in remission. And then it came back with a vengeance. You know, I, I, she asked me what I thought and I told her, I didn't think she should do it. I said, look, mom, I go, we don't know how much time you have left. Why don't we get all the kids, grandkids and just get together and love on each other. And she said, okay. And then the next day she called me back. She said, I'm getting a second opinion. I said, great. And that's the third rule, empower the patient. We do not have a choice about having cancer. We have a choice about how we're going to be treated. And I told my friends when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I said, if I want to sit on my porch on one leg with a tinfoil hat on eating barbecue, you better ask me where you can get me my next slab of ribs, because that's the way that I'm going to empower myself to deal with my cancer in that moment. And the next day it may change, but please empower the patient and their choice. And so that was my mission. And it was a lot for me to hold that space of grief. You know, I, I made it, my, I got on TV, radio. That's how I became a bestseller. And I'll tell you, I know of three women that were diagnosed early, stage one, after hearing me speak. And each time I would kiss and look at my mom and say, we got one. But it was a lot to hold that space. You know, I was on the board of the National Ovarian Cancer Alliance. And I remember, I remember going to one of the events and there were women, young women in their 20s, 20, 20, 1918, mm -hmm. telling me that they had had a full, you know, full hysterectomy and were trying to figure out on the first date, how do you tell somebody you can't have children? Do you say it right away? Do you wait until you fall in love with each other? Like at what point do you reveal this? And what if I didn't want kids now I can't have my own kids and I'm mad about that. And I was wanted everything in my power to be able to help a family or a woman not have to deal with what my family went through, but I'll tell you something else. And then I want to um, let Christina share, which is, you know, after my mom passed, 
I, I land at a new job and moved from Colorado and my support structure to DC where I really, I had lived here before, but I didn't know any, the people that I had been friends with, I wasn't as tight with. And I was in a job I hated and it was awful. And I uh, was asked to resign from that job. First time ever fired from a job in my lifetime because I was, I had gained 20 pounds. I was miserable. It was not in a good place. And I, a friend of mine took me in and I sat on her third floor and I was in a book writing group and I would get up every morning at 5.30 to write with my writing partner who happened to be in Switzerland and I would bawl my eyes out and I would cry and I would cry and I would cry and I would write down everything about my time with my mom, but it wasn't, it's not a sad book. That's the crazy thing. It is a book to give people hope to find the silver lining because it really was about my life and all the things I realized were leading up to me taking care of my mom. And then when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, realizing, wait a minute, no, no, no. Taking care of my mom was leading me up to my own journey with breast cancer and what I'm willing to say. And you don't get to tell my story and you don't get to share about me, you know, and that, and I would post things on Facebook and I had a caring bridge site once things got up and going. And then I did a whole uh, video series about it. So it was cathartic. It was to process grief, but it's also to reclaim my power and be the author of my journey because otherwise I was the victim of the whole thing. And it wasn't until I claimed that authorship that I could be at peace with the whole thing. Interesting. Um, that claiming your authorship, that, that's um, some really good language. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm a language person. I mean, I'm an English and, you know, English high school teacher and professor. So in my head, I'm like, I'm going to use this. I'm going to categorize this language for you. Me. Can have it. You can have um, it. You know, you you mentioned all of these things, and what's weird is that my brain right now is categorizing in two different places. One as my own patient journey, um, as being the patient. And Miss Burton, I saw your face. Like, how do you tell people that you know you're how sway? How do you do that? <laughs> I don't even know. I have no clue. Um, how? See, we just had a conversation here. Um, about like, how do you tell people about your hysterectomy? Um, you know, and then I'm also categorizing it in my academic brain, um, which, you know, I'm, I'm listening to all of these key things from the caretakers and the patients. And it's like all the dots connect, um, but there's like no string, you know, like you can see where you're supposed to, it's just like my, my four-year-old does these like really annoying puzzles all the time, right? <laughs> And he's like, watch me do this 14th puzzle. I'm like, yay. And I don't even look. And I'm like, you're doing a great job. <laughs> um, and it's like, you can see what it's supposed to, if it's supposed to make out a duck, it's supposed to make out a duck. And you can see it as the adult on the other side of the cancer journey, you know, but the people who haven't been there yet, they don't know what it looks like. And so yeah. you're the one taking the string and making the outline and saying like, actually it looks like this. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm seeing it from both uh, points. In terms of my own writing journey, my best and my worst quality is my honesty. My big fat bucket mouth and my <laughs> honesty. Um, and, you know, and I hope that my dad does not like put amen in the chat on Facebook <laughs> Live if he's watching it. Like either one of my family is like, mm, uh-huh. Um, but that's one of my biggest, like that's the, my best and my worst quality is my honesty. Um, you're either going to be very entertained or offended. There's really like no in between with me, to be honest. Um, but I started, um, writing, <laughs> everyone's like, yes, it's me. That's why we're all here together. That's why. Um, and side note, I loved your mother's panty story. Can I just tell this quick story, Stephanie? Do you remember this story? I, no, you have a lot of patients. You may not remember because it was before we got close, but there was one time right after all of my surgery. So I was diagnosed at 27 while pregnant. Um, and I was diagnosed when I was unconscious. So they took my four-year-old out and I had a full face of makeup and I, and I made my yeah, girl. Yes. Hello. I, I would not go into surgery. I was like, mom, I felt my mom doing my braid before surgery. No one told me what was going on because they didn't want me to panic. I had a baby and I was like, whatever, everyone's crying. I was like, I need y'all stop crying. Yeah. And my mom did a braid in my hair. And I had already at this point been blogging about being married because in our group, um, I, you know, me and my husband did a lot of like campus ministry things in college. So we were at Mary Washington. We did that in college. Um, and so I was used to like talking to people and we're the first ones in our friend, friend group to get married. So we're like the parents of our friend group. 
Um, and so I started blogging about being married. I was like, okay, you know, like how is being married after dating for six years? I was like, it's, it's something, it's, it's something, but I'm in too deep. Right. Like, so right. <laughs> meanwhile, my husband brings me a cup of coffee. Um, cause I texted I did him, I notice like, that. I did notice that by the way. I, I, I know. I was like, like, this like this. Mm-hmm. I know. I was like, and he purposely did the the Hopkins mug, and I was like, I see you. He didn't bring an inappropriate one in. Um, but I'd already been blogging about being married, and I was already pregnant and miserable. And then I went into surgery. And part of my story, the long story short, is that I woke up with no organs and a, a preemie. So I was navigating being an. I was newly married in my first year of marriage after dating for six years. Um, I'm, I'm a teacher, so I moved to a new County. It was my first year. Um, I was a new mom. Um, and then I woke up with no organs. Um, and so I was like, well, what do I do? Um, and it's, it's interesting always cause you know, Dr. Weatherton was my doctor. So, but there was this one, you know, so I started after recovering a little bit because I, you know, when things happen and when we all deal with grief, our own type of grief, you know, I go through ebbs and flows of grief because I'm medically infertile to save my life. You know, I have one child, you know, sometimes I, I question whether I want another little gremlin, but I do. Um, so, you know, how do you do that? How do you navigate all of those things? And so I started learning how to navigate that as I was writing, because I'm an oversharer. Like, if you tell me like, oh yeah, there was one time, like, you know, you know, I had a stomach ache in the mall. I'm like, girl, let me tell you a story. Cause it happened. It happened to me, you know? Um, so, I mean, that's how I kind of got to writing is when I'm always an oversharer and I'm already an English teacher. And I really do believe that you should do and be able to do what you teach. Um, so I'm like, if I'm going to force these kids to write, guess what? They should ask me, Hey, what are you writing this aid? I'm like, well, you probably can't read it in class, but it's about my cancer journey, you know, because there are those oversharing moments. Um, 30 second story about the panties. Jennifer, because I think it's all connected. Um, And I, you know, and when you're in your moments of crisis, I totally understand just being worried about your undies. There was one time it was right after surgery. I was upset. I wanted to be home. I finally got home. I was about to start chemotherapy. Um, Right. It was like a couple days before I had a newborn at home. So I was like, I want to be at home. I'm being dramatic. And then um, while having like, you know, issues post anesthesia of going to the bathroom, I popped a blood vessel. I had no clue. Yeah, I know. So like, it sounds super serious, but let me get to the end. It's really funny. Okay. I promise. So I was eating pizza and I was like, I took my son to his appointment and I was like, I need to go to the hospital. So I went and I, I got in to see Dr. Weddington and she's like, you know, you look, you look like a rotisserie chicken is what it like. If you ever want to know, like anytime you go in to see your GI and like, I feel like a chicken like, like a rotisserie chicken with your legs up. That's how I feel like, That's the you one. know, like, and just like, I was like, I'm sitting up there and she's like, um, actually you popped a blood vessel and we need to stop this blood. I'm like, what, excuse me. And so of course I had a panic attack because I didn't want to go back into the hospital. All right. Um, because any cancer diagnosis, whether you're the caretaker or the patient, you don't deal with it all at one time. I could be good as gravy, you guys, for like seven days. And then all of a sudden, I'll go to Target and see some baby clothes. I'm like, but I can't have any more babies. And then in a couple hours, my little four-year-old is going to annoy me. I'll be like, I don't want any babies anyways. Thank goodness you're my only one. Um, you know, so we ebb and flow. And so I'm sitting there and having a panic attack. And then I puked up pizza. My mom's like, you're never eating pizza again. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, and my mom was in the corner and I wanted her over there. Cause you know, I'm like a chicken. I was like, I don't want you to see all the business. Okay. Just over there. And then the, the, <laughs> the ambulance had to get called to take me across. And so everyone's in a hoopla and you're in an oncologist's office. And then the ambulance gets called. So it's extra dramatic, you know, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, but my underwear, I was like, I need, and Stephanie, I told you, I was like, I need my underwear. I was like, I'm literally like, I have popped a blood vessel, y'all. It is not like, <laughs> you're like, there's, you're like, I need underwear. And everybody else like, ma'am, there are more important. <laughs> right? I was like, Where are my underwear? I was like, I will not. I told my mom, I was like, I don't care if I'm dying. Maybe it's too close to say, 
but my mom was like too soon I was like give me my underwear <laughs> underwear they'll probably take them off at the hospital but put them on so in all through in in all three in your blogging and your writing and your in your publishing and in your speaking you mentioned some people who clearly came up and told you about how knowing about your mom's diagnosis changed their own awareness. So that awareness led to earlier diagnosis. But of all the people who've come to you, what's the moment that you, that sat with you where you realized that your writing was really about more than just you and that it had an mm. external mm-hmm. you've been focusing about, right. We've been talking so far about the internal impact mm-hmm. Um, but I realized this as you were talking and when you were talking about this women who were found at stage one as a result, um, what are some of the moments where you realize the external impact that's the result of what you've done? Because- All right, I'll go ahead. I'll jump no. in. Um, are we allowed to swear on this little? <laughs> yes, there's no children. So I think it's- Okay, a- excellent. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was a program leader for a international personal growth and development company by the name of Landmark Worldwide for many years, for about 16 years, I led their seminars. And I, you know, I shared about my entire life all the time. I shared about my ex-husband leaving me. I shared about uh, my mom's cancer and everything that I went through. And I remember a time when I was sharing about it and this would happen so often. And afterwards, this woman, it was always a woman came up to me and she put her hand very gently on my arm and in a very soft voice, she said, Jennifer, at some time you're going to realize this is the most beautiful gift you've ever been given. And in the moment I thought, fuck you, I'm going to throat punch you and throw your ass across the room because that is the most ridiculous thing you can say to me. There are many more ridiculous things people said to me. Like when I was diagnosed with breast cancer and people found out one woman's like radiation is horrible. I'm like, thanks for telling me, take it back. I decline that invitation. So my point in saying all that was I realized People have to, you know, as a caretaker, as somebody who's somebody in your world is going through cancer, we're all humans. We're all experiencing the same or very similar experiences. Those moments of like laughing one moment and crying the next or trying to find the funny and what's happening. You know, my mother was sitting, this is the same month before she died. We called it Sam her little cancer baby. And she's sitting in her chair and she and I on Sundays used to go out to lunch when my grandma was alive. We got to lunch with my grandma. We do some shopping, never buy anything, but always looking, but we'd also cheat on our healthy eating plan. You know, we'd get the Halloween pumpkins or candy corn or something to indulge in. And she looks at me, we're watching dancing with the stars and she could only sit in this rocker because the tumor was pressing in on her lungs. So she had to be able to breathe. So she had to sit back. She's like, do you want a snack? I'm like, sure. And so she goes out, she comes back and she has this bag of Halloween pumpkins that for sh- she for sure got on sale because it's August. So, you know, that stuff was old and she was like shaking it, but she's like, look what I have. I'm like, mm. so she gives me a few. We're watching at the commercial. I look over to talk to her and she's got them balanced on the tumor on her belly. I said, mom, what are you doing? She goes, oh, I'm just using as my snack tray. I go, really? She goes, yeah, I should do the same thing with you. I said, you'd balance snacks on me. She goes, oh no, honey. I balance the ashtray so I could have a cigarette in one hand and my martini in the other. I go, okay, mom, you know, <laughs> you can't make this shit up. And, and my mother helped me write jokes that I did. I was doing comedy at the time and I was worried about offending somebody. And my, my uh, mentor said, ovarian cancer is offensive. Offend people. Like, who cares? Go offend people. And she helped me co-write jokes. She helped me co-write that one. It was another one where she, um, St. Armand's Circle is very posh, posh area in Sarasota, Florida, and had bought all these clothes. And she called me one day. She goes, honey, she goes, I just want to let you know, you know, when we went shopping, it's in St. Armand. And she probably dropped a couple grand on these clothing, on the clothing. She goes, I was going to um, leave you the receipts. You could return it and have the money after I died. But I decided, fuck you, I'm gonna wear the damn clothes while I'm alive. (laughs) I'm like, good on you, mom, you should do that. So, you know, my sharing about it publicly made such a difference for other people and her life made such a difference. And how she approached this whole thing, you know, she would not say she had a bad quality of life 
at all. Not at all. She got to go out to dinner. She was in remission for a couple of years. She taught tap class. She took tap class. She had everything. She was not lacking for anything. And I think it's important that people know that having cancer isn't sad. Mm -hmm. Unless you want to make it that way, there's a lot of joy and funny bits and you got to learn how to deal with it all and roll with the punches. But there's so much of that piece of it in our humanity, um, as Christina was mentioning. And how do you say your first name is Burton? Marisha. Marisha was saying there's like so much for us to contribute. And my life has always been about contributing to others. And so was my mom. So there was never, you know, I wrote it down, right? Um, Stephanie, but I was always sharing about my mom and then eventually always sharing about myself. And when I do podcasting now, it's one of the things I talk about all the time because everything's an opportunity to teach people. And that's important to me. Yes, all of that, literally. So one thing I will say and add to that is the moment never stops actually for me. Every time I'm like, ah, that was the moment. There's another moment that comes and trumps it instantly. Um, I very much so was like you, Jennifer, like y'all go, y'all go, y'all go hear about this day I had, <laughs> let me get to, you know? Um, and some days I would have such a great attitude. I'd be like, yeah, guys, you know, things went great today. Da, 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 da. And then tomorrow I'd be like, this shit sucks. <laughs> That's all I've got to say. <laughs> See you tomorrow. <laughs> um, but it was literally like, I was being real. And how you're saying your mom was living her best. Oh girl, that was me. Um, quick story. I went to Bowie State University. And so 2013, I was supposed to graduate in 2013. And I obviously could not because I was not enrolled in school <laughs> um, because I was in chemo. But I, so I had a week on and then I was supposed to have a week off, which usually turned into two weeks. And then I'd go back for my week on. <clears throat> And so our basketball tournament is the CIAA tournament. We were in the CIAA. Um, uh, Bowie State is the first HBCU in Maryland. And the CIAA tournament is like the most fun. All every, I mean, everybody was like, we're going to CIAAs. And it was in Charlotte, North Carolina. And chemo got pushed back. So I was like, mom, can I go to CIAA? I really <laughs> think that they're going to win this year. Like, I have such a good feeling. It's my scene. It was, you know, my senior year, like, ma, this is my last chance. And she was like, absolutely not, girl. Like, you got a bald head. Like, you're in the middle of chemo. No. I was like, but ma, please. Um, one of my teammates, I had known her and she knew my mom, like, since middle school. I was like, mom, Vivica is going down on Friday. Vivi's driving. I can ride with Vivi. You know, you trust Vivi, right? Like Vivi's gonna make sure I do, I, I can go. So my mom calls Vivica and is like, Vivica, make sure she takes her temperature. Don't let her be around nobody. Make sure she's doing this, da da da. Vivica's <laughs> like, yes, ma'am, I promise. So I got the okay, right? So we're going down to CIAA. I'm thrilled. Mind you, in my back pocket, I have already like, finesse the little something with my cheer coach and on Saturday there's this like super Saturday performance I'm already told coach T like coach T I'm coming finesse me into the routine mm -hmm. <laughs> y'all I'm in the middle of chemo <laughs> I don't have no business on this basketball court in the middle of this cheer routine and at the end of the routine coach T is over the top she actually gets this banner made like with these pictures of me and it's like Marisha Burton ovarian cancer awareness like you know mm -hmm. it's 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 tight and so we work myself into the routine the last 30 seconds of the routine I pop up and I tumble out onto the floor and I'm like jumping in the routine and you know <laughs> doing everything once the crowd realizes what ha what's happening they're like oh my gosh and I mean st standing standing applause round of applause everybody's on their feet you know going crazy I get back on that Monday, y'all, they had to sedate your girl for chemo. Like I was so dehydrated. I was exhausted. They were like, what did you do? I lost my voice because the basketball team ended up winning that Saturday night. So, you know, I'm screaming. They were like, what were you doing? Like, what was, I was like, look at the video. Look at what I was doing. And all the nurses were like, girl, what? <laughs> but you know, even things like that, I posted that on my blog. And every time I, I thought I had reached all the people that I was going to reach, someone else slid into my inbox, slid into my DMs, found my number, found me somehow, some way. 
and was just telling me how my stories impacted them, how my stories Mm -hmm. kept them going, cancer related or non-cancer related. Like there was a girl, she was like, I've been reading, I would look at the, I was on blog spot. So I would look at the analytics, like people in India, Jamaica, you know, Mm -hmm. at one point there were like every continent, someone on every continent was reading my blog. And I was so humbled right? Like I felt so, so, so humbled that this opportunity was helping people get through whatever things that they were going through in their life. And I think those were the moments for me, right? Even in the dark moments, I struggled after really badly with not being in the place that I felt like I needed to be, right? So even staying in school longer, right? First of all, Michelle Obama was the commencement speaker in 2013. So you guys know I was going through it, like at graduation, (laughs) like I should be walking across this stage. So I really struggled after the fact with why am I still in school? I don't know these people, (laughs) like these classmates. I'm a poli sci major. My department was super small. I don't know you people. We're my friends. They graduated. So even down to the small things, Another quick story, my girlfriend Jada, she had a baby, Summer. Summer is going to be three this September. She had a hernia, all this crazy stuff when Summer was born. And our girlfriend got married in New York. So we were like, oh yeah, let's go to the wedding. So Jada, we're gonna, we're supposed to meet at my house and drive up. Jada gets to the house and is like, full on panic attack. I'm like, girl, what is wrong? She's like, Summer has got all these bills in her name. And I just, I don't know what to do. Like she's supposed to be on my insurance, just like going through it. And I'm like, Oh, the insurance company, (laughs) I've got this. Let me tell you what you need to do, right? Because I learned the skills of having those conversations with the insurance company. Um, No, you have this wrong. You're not going to triple bill me for that. You tried it, run that again, right? And just even knowing who to ask for, what to ask for, how you need to run something because I got those skills so early in life. So it's like every time something comes up that, five, six, seven years ago, it was, oh, woe is me. And oh, why is this happening to me? And now I get to help someone do it. I'm like, okay, God, I see. I mean, I'm still a little salty that you dragged me through the mud, but I see why (laughs) (laughs) I get it. Um, It still sucked, but I, I see if I didn't, if I didn't go through it, right. I wouldn't be able to tell this person how to navigate through this area or that area. So I see what you did there. So it, for me, it's like, as cryptic and crazy as it sounds, it's like almost like the gift that keeps on giving, right? Like my story is the gift that keeps on giving. My, even my being able to have the strength to tell my story because it's exhausting also telling your story. It's exhausting sometimes bringing it back up. Um, Y'all are gonna be like, you're so lucky. I literally have one ovary left. They took my right one, but it's like, protect my left one at all costs, right? So every time for me, it's a doctor's appointment or this or that, y'all, my anxiety goes on 6,000. I'm like, oh God, I sneezed. Oh God, there's a pain in my side. Jesus, please don't let this cancer be back because then they're going to take my left over and then I can't have no kid, right? So for me now, the space that I'm in is really weird because I'm like, I want kids. I would, I I need some kids. And even with that space, I sometimes go back to my blogs when I'm kind of in that space where trust the process, don't know why you're here, but soon you're going to realize that the blueprint was not for your, for your eyes. It's not for you to know where you're going to go. And when you get to the point that you need to be, you're going to see, oh, it made sense. Um, so for me, like I said, it's, it's the gift that keeps on giving in a way. Yeah. Mm. So how do we help people who are listening get into journaling? Right. I, I started at the beginning by saying, like, I think there's actually a, a physical medical benefit to it. Right. And there's grow limited. You're right. We can like stack it up on my desk and it'll only make, you know, it'll barely show on the screen here tonight. But there's like a little bit of medical data and there's certainly a lot of anecdotal experience that the three of you have mentioned that, you know, people are talking about more and more. So how do we, um, how do we help people get started? I could take this one. 
Yeah. Um, so getting started, um, as an English teacher, I'm like, what did I teach my kids this week? So I could repeat it. <laughs> um, cause I, I also teach creative writing. Um, so I would say, so there's a theory, like if you're, if you're looking at, um, research and things like that, there's, um, Anne Lamont will, um, so there's a lot of stuff with Anne Lamont, but Betsy Flowers will say that you have like four people in your brain at all time. Um, and it's those competing energies that cause writer's block. So often before we even, so everyone's different. There are some people who are diehard, like paper pencil people. Um, they're like, I have to have it tactile. I, I'm a book sniffer. I'm that person. I will go sniff a book like a psychopath. Um, I actually have books right now that I've got to go pick up from books a million. Um, but like, you know, some people need that tactile, um, know, and know your medium. Yeah, so you need to know your medium or you can type. Uh, so you need to know like what medium you're most comfortable with. There is something about a leather bound or typing. Um, two, you need to know your time of day. Um, do not make writing goals for yourself at the wrong time of day. So for example, um, when I was in college, I was trying to get through the whole Bible. Y'all, I cannot do anything in the morning except barely function on coffee. So making goals to write in the morning is not something that is helpful um, because I know I don't function. Then I function at like 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, that's when I end up functioning. But I, I think the hardest part is getting started because people, I think with anything, I don't know that it's just writing. Um, and there's my, my gremlin screaming. Does anybody want to rent him $25 an hour? <laughs> Um, but yeah. I, I think it's because we disqualify ourselves before producing anything. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're like, well, I don't know about my writing style or this or my experience and will it matter? Um, and I think, you know, a lot of times people say that your most vicious English teacher or your biggest critic, whoever that is in your life, a lot of times your biggest critic may also be the person who you value their opinion, um, more. Um, so I don't take my stuff to, you know, people who like my dad and my husband, because when I take things to them, if I offer them something, it better be pristine or they're gonna be like, well, this and this and that, but it's because I value their judgment. Um, but I think if you kind of sort out what is like that competing energy, cause you know, some people call it like, um, like stream of consciousness when you sit down and you're like, blah, 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 blah. I'm just going to write whatever. Yeah. Um, and some people are great at that stream of consciousness, but unfortunately, sometimes when we do stream of consciousness, we don't just let it go. We have all of those like rules that have been pounded to us. Like, you know, you misspelled something, you did that. You don't need to write. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. There's three donuts in the kitchen in the middle of your writing. Actually. Yeah. You that's stream of consciousness. You can delete later. So I, I think just you know, arguing yeah. with whoever's in your brain. Um, and then letting it all out and knowing that just like our experiences, experiences, writing is fluid, our experiences are fluid. If I don't like my writing in the morning, then I label it in my computer as disgusting. And I'm like, this was disgusting. This was, you know, on May 3rd. And then I label it so that eventually, if I want to look at this disgusting thing, I can. You know, because we, we all three of us, we talked about perspectives, how today things may be beautiful and then tomorrow you know, I'm having a hot flash. Ask, when you go back into your disgusting file, sometimes are you like, oh, that's not so bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. I've got like 27 disgustings. I think there's a great book that I always recommend because I ask my clients to journal all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a great book called The Artist Way. Mm -hmm. And in there, you don't have to read the whole book. One of the things, this is how I actually got started with writing my book, Morning Pages. And I get that some people are not morning people. I am. You could call it the 3 a.m. in the morning, the 7 a.m. in the morning, call it the evening pages. You just grab. And there's something for me about having a notebook and a pen, because I, part of what I use is a lot of neuroplasticity and in the, in the coaching that I give. There's something about physically writing something down. However, at the same time, when I wrote, used to write my blogs, I had to be at the computer because my hand wouldn't write fast enough mm -hmm. as I was thinking. So start with morning pages, three pages every morning. If what you're writing is, I don't know what to write. I don't know what to write. I don't know what to write. Do that. But three pages every morning and have yourself on a reminder that you're going to do three pages a day, every day for 30, pay, for 30 days, or set a timer five minutes a day, every day for 30 days. There's also cards you can get on Amazon. There's, there's books you can get to ask for journaling prompts. It's gotta be a habit though. Do it every day and don't judge yourself. 
just get started. That's really the key piece behind all of it. What's that? I am so in love that you said morning pages because I do them all the time and I assign them to my students and to my college students and, you know, morning pages for, you know, people, cause I was diagnosed at 27. I still teach high school. So that's why I get all their horrible jokes. Um, but <laughs> they're really funny though, but very inappropriate. Um, high school is a different game, you know, but like, you know, morning pages, what I usually call them is like letting the crazies out. Um, you know, I let all the crazy out because sometimes I can't even like those morning pages, if I want to write something good, let's say I'm like, I have a blog post in process in my head. I'm like, okay, I'm going to write about this. I have to let all the crazy people out first. I have to let all these side thoughts of like the donuts. I'm definitely going to eat after this. That's in there. Cause I know that there's one custard and glazed one still left in there. If my husband ate it, y'all need to pray for him. Um, and so like, you know, all those crazy thoughts that would inhibit you from writing what people believe are like those masterful pages. You gotta let the crazy people out first. I think that's such a good point that when you're journaling, you, you guys, all three of you journal for internal and external, mm-hmm. right? And oftentimes, probably most of the people listening right now will start off journaling for more internal mm-hmm. than external. And so it's so true. If the sentence starts and finishes and they don't actually connect or there's something about donuts in the middle, it it doesn't actually matter. You don't have to show it to anybody. That was going to be my point. I have to show it to a soul. I actually journal every morning to create my day of who I'm going to be, how I'm going to show up. And that's just for me. Nobody has to see it. But I'm also a big believer that we are what we speak. We say we are what we eat. We are what we speak. Our speaking creates a reality. And when she says speaking, it's not literally speaking, it's writing, it's manifesting, it's whatever space you put yourself in, right? Yep. Yep. It doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. And that's one thing that I learned because I was very hard on myself, like, oh God, I get, this is, uh, got to, you know, and no, this, I'm not feeling very perfect today. I don't remember who, but somebody said like, Um, if this is all I'm going to get through today, this is all I'm going to get through. As a resident English teacher and professor, I'm giving everyone permission to have bad grammar and bad spelling and emojis in your writing when you're journaling. Make up words. Make up words. Because that's what, that, that is what brings your writing to life. That's what makes it authentic. And that's what makes it very reflective of who you are. My mom is a teacher. So it, education runs in, my, runs in the family. Okay. And when I first started blogging, my mom was like, oh, you're just going to use slang in your writing. Uh, yes, girl. Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, 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 ma'am. I certainly am because it's mine. And, you know, she was like, okay, I was just, you know, all right, you know, quickly marched back into her lane, but she had to understand this is my story. So yeah. remembering wh- whoever you are, wherever you are, if you're listening, it's your story. And however you tell it is however you tell it. And I, I like that you said that because we talked about the exhaustion that may come from telling the story multiple. And that was one of the things when you're going through something, you know, physically, psychologically, you know, there are a limited amount of time where you can tell the same story. I mean, I could tell a funny story over and over again. Um, and I, I do every day. If I find a funny story, you better believe I'm going to tell it. I refuse to keep next saying days. I refuse yeah. to keep talking about it. That's why I said, and, up and that's what the today. good thing about writing yeah. is, is that you have essentially, you know, an artifact over and over again to where if someone's like, Hey, how, how did that experience? And you can tell them, honestly, like, I'm not in a place where I can take that emotional journey with you. Um, because we ebb and flow and but today my I blog. Can't it, but yeah, go <laughs> check out September 17th yeah. and read all about it. Yeah. I am. Um, Every time I do one of these, I always have the same problem, which is at some point I start getting messages saying, you're running out of time, you're running out of time, you're running out of time. And I've been, I've been getting those messages and and dutifully ignoring them this evening, which I don't normally do, but I (laughs) I don't want to stop you all. I wanted to let you, let you go. Cause I think, um, you all do an amazing job of bringing out your individual essence and giving people a sense of strength that one can derive from the journey, be it as a patient, be it as a caregiver. And you just don't ever want to interrupt that. So thank you for being with us here tonight. Thank you for writing, blogging, journaling, and being willing to talk about it. And to everybody listening, if you are a quiet person who never wants anybody to read your journal, journal. Make a gratitude list, one word every day. It doesn't have to be paragraphs. If you're somebody 
who like me can go endlessly and talk endlessly. You can do your three pages, but find your own one sentence that somebody said here tonight to turn it into your start journaling. Um, and when you need a reminder about how you can do it, come back and listen here, because I think these three women have given us a very good sense of what it means to find strength um, through a path and to record it um, for themselves and for others both. And everybody should join us June 6th at 8 a.m. I will not forget to say it. We have our race that day and it is a virtual race. Um, and all of our um, survivorship program materials will be online. And we of course have the, our virtual race similar to how we did it last year with some new touches and some new introductions. So everybody should join us on June 6th. You can join us via the Facebook page. You can join us online at strivingthrive.org. You can sign up for the race at run sign up. Um, and so thank you very much, ladies. I greatly appreciate it. I had a wonderful evening and I wish you all the best. Thanks.